So there'll be a few people coming in, going out, that's the nature of these things. But uh, for this evening's Dhamma talk, it was uh, some other suggestions were passed through to me. And the main topic of the talk this evening is about a person who asked, you know, how do you deal with chronic pain? And what sort of techniques of meditation and Buddhism attitudes can actually help with that? But I wanted to ex expand that, not just with chronic pain, but also other things which one doesn't like in life. Because I know there is a real chronic pain, but there's also those people who are pains in the backside. And they're very chronic. <laughs> and how do we deal with those as well? Because it's the same attitude which we can deal with, you know, really, really bad pains and other emotional difficulties as well. So it's how to deal with those chronic things which we just do not like. And it may not even just be with emotions. I know one thing which everyone who comes here has to deal with every week when I give a talk is chronic bad jokes. <laughs> and the one today to get it out of the way is about the lady who actually, her house burnt down. And when she rang her insurance agent, she said, oh, just give me a check for the value. So we don't do that. You know, we give replacement. We get you a new house with all the fittings in it. He said, I kind of get a check. No, you just get replacement. So she said, okay, I suppose I should cancel the life insurance for my husband then. <laughs> <laughs> she would just get a replacement. <laughs> okay, there we go, another chronically bad joke. <laughs> but now we go to actually the serious part of actually how to deal with you know, some of these difficulties which we have in life. And basically it all f um, uh, revolves around a nice statement of the Buddha which said that you know, there are two parts to pain, to unpleasantness, to difficulty in life. And he said it's the physical part and the emotional part. He called it the two arrows which, which go into a human body. And he said, the physical part is just part of life, you can't do much about that, but the emotional response we can do everything about. And that is actually the key to understanding how to deal with chronic pain, how to deal with things which we don't like, things which disturb us. There's two parts to the pain which we feel. I remember some um, person gave me some research done in neuroscience. They said actually there is, whenever you feel a, a pain sensation, say in the hand, there's actually two pathways, goes to different parts of the brain. It seems, it almost does um, confirm physiologically something which the Buddha said. Now the one which is actually the, the ache, the pain, and the other one is actually which gets the emotional response going. And it's amazing just how much we can change the emotional response we have to things like pain, to disappointment, to anxiety and to depression. Even today someone came along and said just how much they get depressed. And I said, well, you know, depression is part of life. Change your emotional response to it. Enjoy your depression. Milk it for everything it's worth. When you're depressed you don't have to go to work. You can sleep in. People give you food you like. They want to cheer you up. It has many advantages when you get depressed. So don't think, oh, I'm depressed, I don't like this. Again, change your attitude towards it and then it becomes so positive, you enjoy being depressed so much because you get so many benefits, then you're not depressed anymore. <laughs> now that's an interesting little anecdote there of how we can actually change things around, it's the way we look at these things. And when it comes actually to physical pain, actually things which actually hurt, again there's a lot of ways we can actually deal with that. First of all with our attitude because one of the biggest parts of pain, even chronic pain, is the fear of what's going to happen in the future. It's all, I can't stand this any longer. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, in the old movies or the old books when they say, you know, about torture, they say, this is going to hurt. They say, this is, you're going to wish you were dead. Why do they say those things? It's because of that fear of what's going to happen. That is even worse than the pain. It's one of the reasons why I tell doctors and nurses, please, when you go out to, to uh, inject something into someone, don't say, this is going to hurt. <laughs> and that makes it hurt much more. And you've all had experiences like that, I certainly have, 
I remember just when I was a monk in Thailand, walking barefoot on arms round and stepping on a nail. It went about two inches into my foot. It's a long way, a big four inch nail, it half it went right inside my foot. It didn't hurt at all. Until somebody said, wow, that's terrible. And as soon as I said that, it started to hurt. <laughs> now, have you ever had experiences like that? Again, it's sometimes what we add on, what we expect to happen to those experiences, with those experiences. That is where a lot of the pain comes from. So, I'm sure that you've uh, seen all those movies, or um, not movies, but documentaries on hypnosis and how we can actually change the reaction of our mind using hypnosis to physical feelings. Somebody told me that it was uh, one TV show where they put a person in a freezing cold um, tub of water. And, but they, they convinced this guy under hypnosis it was nice and warm, just like a warm hot bath. Do you like going in warm hot baths this time of year? Really nice, warm and hot, it's very, very nice. I don't usually indulge, but I just remember one of the people here, we went to Bhutan together, and when I walked up this mountain, when you came down again, all your legs were very sore because, you know, really exerting yourself. And I remember just going into the bath, a good excuse at last, a monk can have a hot bath. And it was lovely just to relax there in the hot But this particular case, it was ice cold water. But they convinced him it was a warm hot bath and he was having a wonderful time in the cold icy water. And I mentioned that story because a few days ago it was very cold here in Perth. Did you feel the cold? Were you just freezing, you know, in the early morning temperatures, three degrees, two degrees in Perth? Hypnotize yourself. Just tell yourself, oh, it's so warm today. Oh, isn't it such a wonderful day today? And then you don't feel the cold. The, true. A lot of it is again in the mind because we feel the cold, we don't like the cold. Remember, use your rational mind. Cold is good for you. People who live in cold climates live much longer. Look, what, when you put the milk in the freezer, it doesn't go off. <laughs> you put the cheese, the fruit in the freezer, it lasts a long time. You're just like, same stuff as an apple. So, you know, wonderful, it's been nice and cool, I can add years to my life. You've been frozen, preserved. <laughs> so when you think things like that, you have a good attitude, and you find it doesn't hurt. How much of the life comes along when, you know, somebody says it's hot today, and you're having a wonderful time until you actually see the temperature, it's 40 degrees, and suddenly you feel hot. So much of life you can actually, you've had those experiences yourself, that actually it's when we add what we expect, when a nail goes into your skin. We get afraid it's cold, or it's too hot. It's amazing with the things we don't like in this world, it's just basically conditioned onto us. It's what we add with our mind, which is why that you can do things under hypnosis. And a pe person can, uh, sit in an ice cold tank and have a wonderful time. So there's another part of our mind which can actually not react to that pain, that discomfort. And this is actually what we try and teach people with chronic pains. I always remember one of the guys who came here many years ago, he'd been here about 31 years, and he had one of these very, very bad chronic pain disorders. I think something to do with degeneration of the spine. And at the time, he was one of about only about eight or nine people here in Western Australia who were legally allowed to take any medication, any drug, even prohibited drugs, because the pain was so bad at the time. He could take anything. And he came up and told me that the, the uh, hospital in Osborne Park, which was dealing with these uh, chronic pain sufferers, had devised a scale so they could tell their friends and relations roughly what they were feeling, because it's very hard to describe pain. You say, it hurts. Yeah, but how much does it hurt? Hurts a lot. Can you give more detail? And so, these um, 
doctors, they could take a brain scan, they could actually say just exactly what type of pain it was. And he described to me, the sort of the level of pain which he was experiencing constantly was exactly the same that an ordinary person would experience if they were having their arm cut off with a chainsaw. And he was experiencing that constantly. And that was an objective standard. They could actually do the brain scans and say, this is what it, this guy is actually feeling. So you can imagine just that degree of pain, intensity he was feeling. And that was one of the reasons why he came to a place like this, to learn some Buddhism, some meditation, some psychology, to deal with that incredible, intense pain which was there all the time. I know one thing, that he got this incredibly good meditation as a result because he had to. Now there was a great incentive for him to find a way to be at peace with the pain. And he managed to do it. Because I remember him coming up to me once and just with a big smile on his face and say, I've finally done it, Ajahn Brahm, I've finally done it. I said, what have you done? And I knew he'd been meditating and I sort of second guessed him. Have you got the ECG to be flat, to be able to meditate you know, under hospital conditions so that you, you know, your brain actually, so your, mind, your sort of heart stops and gets very peaceful. He said, oh yeah, I did that weeks ago. Now I've got the EEG to be flat. And so he could actually get so still in his meditation, so peaceful, that even the ECG and the EEG flatlined. Totally peaceful and still. That's what he learned because of the extreme pain. He had to somehow be at peace with these things. And he found that was the way that he was free of the pain. It just basically vanishes. But I'm just going to go back a bit to attitude because I was just saying earlier about how fear creates so much pain. When you think it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt and it does hurt. And you always remember that one of the Anagarikas you all know who's been living at Bodhinyana Monastery for a long time. I always remember the time when I was actually walking to the workshop, this is maybe 20, 30 years ago. I was walking to the workshop in our monastery and I saw this, this uh, man coming in the opposite direction. He had a pair of pliers in his hand and in the teeth of the pliers was one of his teeth with all blood over the pliers. And I thought, what have you done? And he said, oh, I just, you know, just took out one of my teeth. And I thought, how can you do that? You know, even I was impressed. This guy, you know, just took out his own tooth with a pair of pliers from the workshop. And now, <laughs> now you know, I said, what did you do that for? He said, well, you know, just going to a dentist. You know what it's like, you make appointments and they don't have the right day. And when you actually do make an appointment, you find it's cancelled afterwards. You know, just sometimes a dentist are really, and they charge you a lot of money as well, unless you're a monk because of, the, the husband of the president is a is a dentist and does our teeth for free, otherwise they get bad karma. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> no, they're very good. They're very kind, generous. But sometimes it is a lot of problems, you know, going to the dentist. And we're living in Serpentine, which is a long way from Perth, and it's a long way to go, it's a long distance, a lot of time. So he said, well, I just I don't bother going and making an appointment, I just do it myself. So he took his own tooth out. You can see, you know, why. Wouldn't that be wonderful, you don't have to go to the dentist, do it yourself. There's many things you can do yourself these days, you know, do it yourself, hardware shops, do it yourself. Dentist. But anyway, not to be recommended, I get into big trouble. But this was an incident where I asked him, how did you do that? And what he explained was a very insightful little exercise or little e explanation of how you can deal with pain by overcoming fear first of all and staying much more in this thing we call the present moment because he said to me, he said, when I decided to pull out my own tooth instead of going to the dentist that never hurt when I walked to the workshop that didn't hurt either when I picked up the pair of pliers, that never hurt. When I put it on my tooth, that was okay, that didn't hurt. When I wiggled the tooth, that hurt for about five seconds and then it was out. 
and afterwards it didn't hurt that much. It was only like you know, two, three, four, five seconds, that's all. But you think about doing that and it starts hurting even now, <laughs> even though it's not your tooth. <laughs> now you understand where pain comes from. You know, you think, ooh, that's terrible. You see that the anticipation, the fear, the expectation, that is what hurts most of all. Which is one of the reasons why that sometimes we can use that psychology to not live too much into the future, to overcome fear, to be here right now and you find much of the pain of life just vanishes and disappears. Because you never have fear anymore. You never think this is going to hurt. You never think like that anymore. Which means that if it does hurt, it only hurts for a couple of seconds and that's it. No more. So if we understand the fear component to pain, and we can overcome that and just live much more in this present moment, which we keep on training people to do, right now you're not in any pain, no problem at all, who knows what the future is going to be. And a lot of the times the future is nowhere near as what you expect it to be. So you don't need to worry so much about that pain. Leave it alone. Just be here right now and you find pain is far easier to bear when you don't anticipate what's going to happen next. So often people say, I can't stand it any longer. It's a longer thing which is a problem. As long as you're in this moment right now, you're already bearing it, you're already being here, it's not a problem. It's our tendency to be afraid because we still live far too much in the future, never right now. It doesn't hurt when you decide to take out your own teeth, when you're walking to the workshop or picking up the prize. It's only when you put it on a couple of seconds, that's all, and it's out. Can you do that? You have to be able to train yourself in this you know, mental discipline of meditation to be able to do that. And if you can do that, it makes life so much easier. Because we always have the aches and the pains and stuff which happen. And it's not just physical pain as well. It's the other things like we're afraid of the interview. Or we're afraid of the, you know, going up to speak to someone we really like and invite them out. Now we're afraid when we go to the doctor to get the results of our biopsies. There's so much fear which comes up in this world. And I can understand that sometimes people are even afraid to talk to me. I'm a monk. I'm not a guard from Guantanamo Bay. <laughs> but sometimes people are, they're afraid. And sometimes you ask, why are they like that? And one of the reasons is, again, because that fear comes from uh, the lack of general kindness. Because when you are kind to anything, you don't have any fear. That kindness which you have towards yourself and to other beings is one of the great antidotes to fear. I was telling people in the retreat about the one time when I went to see one of my favorite monks in Thailand who died some years ago, Ajahn Tate, going into his presence. He was one of those people who was so soft and kind, who emanated that compassion so strongly that I would never felt afraid at all. I mean, not at all, which was a weird experience that you realize that that monk would never harm you in any which way. He would never uh, criticize you, embarrass you, or whatever, in front of others. And if ever you've experienced such kindness from another being, the feeling is you don't want to move from their presence. You feel so relaxed because in so many other areas of life you've been hurt and you're afraid you're going to be hurt again. It's again this pain thing and anticipation. And sometimes you feel so relaxed in a person's presence, you know even if you haven't met them before, that you are perfectly safe. It's one of the reasons why the, you know, some animals, whether dogs, cats, snakes or whatever, they can come up to you and they know they're perfectly safe and you're safe in their presence, which means that you'll never harm one another. And it's wonderful in monastic life because we develop that kindness to such a degree that sometimes these dangerous animals, they do come close. I was telling the people in the retreat, 
that some years ago, you know, I came so close to a tiger, a big tiger, and it was only about four foot away from me. And that's absolutely true, this huge tiger, and I was only four feet away and I wasn't at all afraid. Was that amazing? Was that impressive? <laughs> it was in the zoo. <laughs> The big iron bars between me and the tiger. <laughs> That's why I wasn't afraid. <laughs> but, but anyhow, <coughs> you know, you've seen all these snakes in Thailand. I quite like snakes. I felt very sorry for them. And they do all these amazing things with the snake stories. But you know, when you have that kindness, you don't feel afraid, and other people don't feel afraid. And when you don't have afraid, there's actually no fear. When there's no, sorry, there's no fear, there's no pain either. So much of the pain comes when we tense up out of fear you know, because the needle's going into our body for an injection or because you know, there's a, another type of pain, a pain of some sickness or whatever inside of us. It's amazing when we can get over that, come that fear which again projects into the future, we lose the present moment and that is a huge source of pain in our body. It's mentally added to the physical feeling. And that's one thing which you can take away. The fear of how this is going to work out, whether you can stand it any longer. Instead of being afraid, then you actually just leave it alone, you let it be. And it's a wonderful thing that there are times, or maybe in each one of your lives, when you do have severe pain, such severe pain you don't have a choice. You know you can't fight it, you know you can't escape from it. Your back's against the wall. And when those times happen, it's incredible that you do remember some of these teachings or some of these words of advice to let things be, not fight anymore, you can't win. So you let it go. And as many times in my life I've done that and it, the result is really, really incredible. In the first book which I wrote, Opening the Door of My Heart, or Your Heart, or Our Hearts, Everyone's Hearts, that I told the story of a very, very, very bad toothache which I had in the jungles of Thailand. I don't know why I'm focusing on teeth this evening, <laughs> but this was a very bad toothache. And again, there was no telephones, there's no dentists for miles around you in the jungles. And there's no way of sort of even getting anywhere, no cars, no transport, in the middle of the jungles, away from everywhere. And it was such a poor monastery, there wasn't even any aspirin or paracetamol in the medicine cabinet, there's nothing to take at all. And that, uh, I don't know why it is, when you get these pains, I know actually why it is now, when you get these pains they always get worse at night time. Why is that? I think it's because the fear grows at night time and the fear makes that pain even more intense. But anyway, as it got very, very late, the pain in my jaw was so intense. I'd have read afterwards, and the dentists will actually say this is true, that some of those uh, pains, inf infections in your teeth can get so incredibly strong, they can infect the brain, they can actually drive you crazy. And I thought it was really going to drive me crazy. It was the worst toothache I've ever had in my life. Nothing else has matched that, anywhere close. Intense pain. And I was trying everything I could to try and overcome that pain. First of all, my meditation. But my meditation, at the time, I tried to suppress the pain, tried to get rid of it with the force of the will, trying to move my mind somewhere else so I couldn't experience that pain. Never try that. Never try focusing somewhere else when there's a pain in one part of the body, trying to focus on the other part. You won't be able to succeed if it really is an intense pain. The pain will keep compelling you to actually to watch it. So I couldn't actually even meditate, the pain was just too strong. But we have another type of meditation which we do called walking meditation, where you very slowly, mindfully walk backwards and forwards on a path. And eventually I tried that but I had to give up that because I was not doing walking meditation. I noticed I was doing running meditation. <laughs> Because whenever you are in great pain, you're so desperate, you can't do anything slowly. Everything is jerky and fast. And I was actually running backwards and forwards. And the last thing I tried was doing some chanting. 
You know, sometimes that we have all these superstitions, if you do some special chanting, miracles can happen. And I never believed that at first, because remember I was a scientist before, theoretical physics at Cambridge University. We don't believe things that easy. All this, ra this uh, rigmarole of superstitious chanting, I never really believed that at all. But I tried it anyway, which is what you do when you're desperate. Anything you'll try. And I tried the chanting and I had to stop that after a few minutes because I realised I was shouting at the top of my voice. <laughs> and I was afraid I'd wake up all the other monks in this monastery because again, when you're desperate, you can't do anything even softly. Even when you speak, you're shouting. And I had one of those wonderful experiences when your back was against the wall. You, as Ajahn Chah used to say, you can't go forward, you can't go back, and you can't stay still. You really, everything is just hopeless. And those experiences, if you ever have those experiences, you can't go forward, you can't go back, and you can't stay still. Those are brilliant moments in your life. The opportunities to see things in a different way. And the only thing I could think of was those words, just let go. And I did it. I let go. Because I had to, there was no choice. And as soon as I let go, always this is one of the great experiences of my life, immediately, not just after a second or two, immediately the pain vanished. It just wasn't there anymore. And in its place was this incredible, delightful bliss. I was actually happy. And it was such a weird experience that that could actually happen. You could have intense pain and then let go. I mean really let go. And it was just beautiful peace. And even though it was in the middle of the night, you couldn't do anything else except just meditate for a little while and then just lay down and not really go to sleep, just have a very light sleep because you, know, you were just too happy. And you woke up in the morning and then I was, had a toothache, not that bad. Went to see the doctor, dentist afterwards. But the amazing thing was you could take an intense pain and just by letting it be, it vanished. What had happened, I'd taken away the emotional, mental part of that pain. The physical part was there, but it was tiny compared to the emotional. I don't want, I can't stand this. It taught me that what you add, what human beings add onto the physical feelings of pain is more than 90% of the feeling, usually 95, 96%. The feeling is only feeling. What we add onto it is huge. And because of that, you know, from that time on, it meant I wasn't really afraid of pain. Because you always know what you can do with it. You can, if you can't get rid of it, you know, the easy way is to take a Panadol or Paracetamol and Aspirin or something or just to stretch or to do whatever you can to get rid of the, the physical discomfort. But at the very end you can always just let things be. And what does it actually mean by letting things be? What it means by letting things be is being kind. I've spent a whole sort of week trying to teach people how to let things be, how to let go down at monastery. But sometimes it's very hard to know exactly what you have to do. So a much better way of describing it is like opening the door of your heart to the pain. Not trying to get rid of it, not rejecting it, but respecting it as part of nature and literally opening the door of your heart, not trying to get rid of it at all allowing it to be, which is what loving-kindness is. When you really have loving-kindness, compassion, it's not just compassion to things you like, it's compassion to things you don't like, treating everybody equally and every phenomena equally as well, cold or heat, whatever you like, whatever you don't like, everything you open your heart to with respect and kindness. And if you do that, the things which you don't like, they actually change. It's an amazing thing to do, but the, the story which is the, usually the good one for people with chronic pain, the old story of the monster in the Empress Palace, get out of here, I'm not going to go through the whole story because I'll probably tell it every other week, the, the, the monster in the Empress Palace, get out of here, you don't belong, when this monster came into the palace, and of those few unkind words, the monster grew an inch bigger, more ugly, more smelly, more offensive, and when the emperor came back, 
and knew exactly what to do. Instead of saying, get out of here, you don't belong, why are you sitting in my chair? The emperor said, welcome. Thank you for coming to visit. It's very wonderful you're here today. And those few kind words, kind deeds, kind thoughts, that monster grew an inch smaller, less of a problem. And that is a classic example of how we deal with even chronic pain in the body. Welcome it, instead of trying to say, get out of here, you don't belong. It's part of having a human body. We have pain from time to time, sometimes really chronic, acute, terrible pain. It's part of life. And what do we do? Get out of here, you don't belong, I don't want you. That makes it bigger, more of a problem. And I tell that story to you because there will come a time, you know, when just the, the painkillers don't work. What are you going to do? Please remember the story of the monster. Saying, get out of here, makes it far worse. Bigger, more of a problem, more difficult. But if you can actually have the courage and the wisdom and the compassion to say, welcome, thank you for coming then you will notice that that pain will get an inch smaller, less, of a, less painful, easier to bear. You are overcoming pain by realizing it's a negativity which we add to it is the worst part of the problem. The mental part, not the physical part. And it's, it works every time which I have to try that when you give it kindness, just like the story of my uh, food poisoning two or three years ago, don't have that many stories about pain because I'm a healthy monk, I know how to look after myself. But with that physical pain of the, uh, the food poisoning, I just gave that food poisoning kindness. Thank you for coming to visit me, even though I was in agony with cramps in my cave down at Serpentine. And it took only 20 minutes for that term, food poisoning to disappear. Just by giving it kindness. You can understand what happens in your body when you give a part of your body kindness and compassion. It relaxes. Because it relaxes, you know, tight parts, inflammation just opens up. The body's energies can go in there and do its healing. But when you're really tense, you don't allow stuff to go into that injured part of the body. And just learning how to relax, open up through kindness, allowed healing to happen really, really quickly. So sometimes that, you know, I know just what to do when there's a great pain. But it's not just physical pain, because there's the emotional pains as well. Sometimes, you know, you don't feel, you know, how many talks have I given the last week? I don't know how many talks, because teaching a retreat, there's usually two or three talks a day I have to give. I know like anybody else sometimes, you know, I don't want to give a talk tonight. I don't feel like it. I just want to go to bed. I just want to chill out, put my feet up and read a book. Why do I have to keep on to it? But instead of actually getting negative, because I know every time I get negative like that, I am making pain. So instead, just like the physical pain, you have beautiful compassion to whatever you have to do in life. You have to go to work in the morning. I don't want to go to work. Why? You're adding the. You've got to go anyway. So make fun. Open the door of your heart to Monday mornings. <laughs> oh, what joy to go to work on a Monday morning. And look, I, <laughs> there are some images which I can never get rid of. I don't actually keep traumatic images, I keep the opposite, inspiring images. I remember visiting UK years ago, and as I was visiting UK, somebody was taking me from the South London to Heathrow Airport in the morning, in the traffic, and the schools were going, the kids were going to school, and they had you know, the, what they call the lollipop ladies. These are the people who look after the crossings. Here in Australia they have flags. Over in UK they have these big poles with this circular you know, stop sign. 
And I will always remember that this woman, maybe you know, 55, 60 year old woman, you know, English lady with the lollipop, she was dancing, she was doing rap with the, with the, the lollipop, dancing her way across the road and she made so many people happy that morning, including me, going to work on a Monday morning, me going for a long flight. That's all you need to do, just had a little bit of fun to being a lollipop girl. <laughs> so isn't it, why can't we do that on our way to work on a, fight on a Monday morning? Maybe sound your hooter, but you know, make it sort of musical. To make, do, do, do we have musical hooters? <laughs> Instead of just beep, beep, beep. You know, can we have it just like, you know, Beethoven's fifth? Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> <laughs> just to make life a bit more interesting. If you haven't seen yet, but in Montreal, I mean, the Rodney sent me a picture of this the other day. In Montreal, you know, the, the local government there have actually improved the bus stops. Have you been, for those of you who catch buses to work in the morning, sitting down on the chairs in the bus stop, that's really boring. In Montreal, they have swings like in the children's playground. So the people waiting for the bus were swinging backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. It's an innovative and much more fun. You have to do that. But can't we make it more fun? And apparently that many people miss their buses because they're having too much fun on the swings <laughs> going to work on a Monday morning. <laughs> you have to do these things. So why not actually open the door of your heart and give it more fun? Which is the other thing about pain. It's hard when you're in pain to laugh. But sometimes if you can laugh, it takes away a lot of the pain. Except, except I remember going to one lady, she was our secretary here years ago, a very nice girl, but you know, like many women, you know, eventually she had to have hysterectomy. And if any of you women have had that operation, it's one of the most painful operations. And it's also, you know, because hysterectomy means you can't have kids anymore, emotionally it's very difficult. So she gave me a call, I said, Brahm, can you please come and see me? I'm feeling a bit depressed, I've just had a hysterectomy. But she also said, Ajahn Brahm, please, 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 no jokes. <laughs> because, you know, if I laugh it really hurts. And I did try my best, but I did fail. <laughs> the poor lady, <laughs> she was laughing, ah, ooh, ah, ooh. That really hurt. <laughs> but <laughs> so if you think my jokes are painful, you know, wait till you have a hysterectomy and hear them. <laughs> so, but it did take away much of her pain, you know, when you had a few few laughs in the hospital. And that's why that you know a lot of times if I go to the hospitals and I actually see people who are sick, I always have a few jokes up my sleeve to tell them because you know, that takes away the pain and the aches and that's why. Don't go into the hospital and say how you're feeling today. The most dumbest question you know, in, the, in the world. You know, sometimes they, they, they feel terrible, that's why they're in hospital. So tell them a few jokes. You know, about, what's a nice, like a hospital joke, about that one nice thing I told a few people, um, it, uh, you know, from Indonesia, Hong Kong. It's about that guy who went to hospital because he had a, a, an accident on a motorbike. And they had to amputate his leg. And uh, unfortunately it does happen, it happens here as well sometimes, they amputate the wrong leg. <laughs> they do. That's, have you been in hospital? Actually, that's actually right even these days, high-tech hospitals like we have in Australia, they actually write on there and felt to place this one. <laughs> so they know which one they're supposed to be operating on. As soon as they realised their mistake, you know, they had to go into the, the uh, surgery and get the other one cut off as well. And of course, you know, once he recovered, the first thing he did was hire a lawyer and sue the hospital. But he lost his case. He lost his case. He didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> so you'd, you'd tell that in the hospital, these people having, having knee reconstruction surgery or whatever, and they laugh their heads off and they don't feel so painful anymore. <laughs> now you can see the laughter, the funny side of pain. People who have chronic pain, please don't just give them more negativity. When you can have some fun with your body, and also fun with life, 
you find it doesn't hurt so much. You can see just how much of life, how much of the pain is what we add on. And we can actually do something, we can add something else onto the pain. Instead of some negativity, I don't want to be here, why is it me, how long is this going to last? When we put a bit of fun and kindness, change our attitude and what's happening in life, the whole world changes. Just the general principle of Buddhism, you can't change this world, but you certainly can change the way you look at it. You can change your reaction to it. You can change your perception of it. And that is all you need to do. To actually to get past these things. Remember just uh, some of the other things which uh, of the pain. Uh, this one of our monks over in monastery, he was having this uh, really bad back pain. And it's terrible if you're a monk having bad back pain. Oops. If you have bad back pain, because you're supposed to be meditating. went to see his doctor and he said, oh, the worst thing you can possibly do is sit cross-legged and meditate with a back like that. You know, stand up, lay down, but don't sit. And he told him, look, I'm a monk. Meditation is my life. I can't sort of get rid of that. But this was a very smart monk. And you know, because the doctors couldn't help, he just changed a bit of his attitude. And interesting what he did. That's actually, this is a bit off... Uh, off the um, the topic, maybe it's not off the topic because it was a chronic pain. He actually did a bit of insight and a bit of thinking outside the box, because apparently the pain was because his spine was uh, degenerated and it was very weak. So what he did was actually compensate the weakness in his spine by learning how to develop the muscles either side of his spine, starting off by just touching his back with his fingers, you know, the muscles on either side of the spine, to become aware of them. There's so much of our body we're not aware of at all, because we don't need to be. And by keeping on stroking those muscles either side of the spine, soon he became aware of the very existence of those muscles. In neurology, you know, you're just making those connections in the brain, you know, so you can actually feel those muscles. And the next thing, a bit of trial and error, once he was aware of those muscles, even without touching them, he could actually learn how to stretch them. Trial and error, the awareness could actually see how they stretch and how they contract. And once he could do that, the next stage, he could exercise those muscles. Just like you know, you exercise your arms or exercise your legs through running. By working those muscles, he exercised them, and of course, every time they exercised, they got stronger and stronger and stronger until they became so strong, much stronger than my equivalent muscles, because I don't need that, I've got a good back. His muscles became so strong, they, they compensate for the weakness in his spine and now he can meditate without any problem. Brilliant little way of finding another way to overcome things like pain. Just you know, use some thinking outside the box, use some different methods. And a lot of times it was just using some mindfulness, which not many people have. Now if you do have chronic headaches, why? Be aware. And sometimes, all the awareness can do, you can see sometimes a chronic headache gets a tiny bit less. Why? The mindfulness is always something which gives you feedback. You can see things change. The pain is not always the same. It's chronic, it's always there, but it gets worse, it gets better. Finding the causes. And if you can find the causes, what makes it less painful, then you have some control over the pain. You know, you know what makes it worse, what makes it better. And you can keep adding that better, 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 until a lot of times the pain gets very, very easy to bear. And one of those things which you will notice always makes it better is the kindness, the softness, not the fear. The fear makes it worse. The fear takes an ordinary pain and makes it into a huge pain, which is one of the reasons why the pain gets worse at night. Fear. Or well, it gets worse when you go and see the doctor. <laughs> so sometimes that, so that fear, once you understand it, can be overcome with kindness with a bit of laughter as well. And that means you can have some control over the pain in your life. And of course it just doesn't work with the physical pain, it also works with the emotional pain as well. 
I don't know what it is that sometimes, even during the retreat, sometimes people were saying, they were sitting there for hour and after hour meditating and their knees started to hurt. What did they do to overcome the pain in their knee? They could move, that's one way. The other way they said, they started to love their knee. Ah, oh, knees, I love you. And the pain vanished. Just the same as that story I tell you, playing soccer in the streets of London as a kid, falling over and going for a tackle and falling over and scraping the skin off my knee, which really hurt, it stank. And my mother would just uh, crouch down and kiss it better. It was just her kindness would take the pain away. Every time that happened, the kindness of a mother, you know, I had my experiences, would always take pain away, which is one of the reasons why, you know, she would come and visit you in hospital and straight away the pain, much of the pain would vanish. If you have someone you love very much and they love you and you're very sick in hospital, whether it's emotional pain or physical pain, just the presence of someone who's kind and loving takes a huge amount of pain away. And if there's no one else can do it for you, there's always yourself. And so because I live a lot of time in solitude, because I'm a monk, there's no one else can visit me when I'm sick, I can always visit myself <laughs> and be kind to myself. And when I have that kindness towards myself, much of the aches and pains of life can vanish very, very easily. Physical pains and even emotional pains. Oh, I don't want to do this. I'm tired. Why do I have to do this? That type of negativity is very easy to overcome with a bit of kindness. Opening the door of your heart to the situation in which you're in. Not being negative, not by trying to get rid of things, but embracing life. Embracing the difficulties, doing things you don't like. The heat, the cold, the tiredness, the headaches, the tummy aches, whatever it is you experience in life. How about instead of trying to get rid of it all the time, welcome it. Like the anger eating demon. Be compassion. And then you find much of the, the pain of life will disappear. And especially the chronic pains. The pains you think are sometimes unendurable, they can be endured very easily with kindness, being in this moment, lack of fear. Just simple teachings which you can learn here, which is one of the reasons why in pain clinics they teach such things as meditation. They do teach such things as mindfulness and kindness because it actually does work. It actually takes away some of the worst pains of life. So you can be happy and free. So that was a little talk because someone asked me, can you please, they have someone with chronic pain, can you please tell me how to deal with chronic pain so that these teachings you have here can be useful to all types of people. Maybe you haven't got chronic pain, but if I carry on talking much longer, maybe you will. <laughs> So maybe this is a good time to stop. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Very good. So some comments or questions about learning how to do with the painful stuff of life. Here we go. This is from overseas. First of all, see what countries we have today. We have USA and uh, Toronto. First of all, from the USA, is there a way to distinguish fear from being alert to potential risks? So or is this just a subtle form of trying to predict an uncertain future? Again, obviously, if there's a bushfire coming your way, you have to run. You know, if there's a tiger running towards you and you're not a monk, you obviously have to run the opposite direction. But some there's obviously there's the obvious fears, but sometimes we have too much fear. And sometimes, in fact, most of the times, we're afraid of things which don't really, pretend, uh, don't really um, uh, provide a risky future for us. We're just afraid of things which probably never will happen at all. So sometimes you can understand there's some things which you should be afraid of. And one of the biggest things you should be afraid of is fear itself. In other words, it's the fear which causes all the problems of life, most of the problems of life. Still remember a, a little book which I read 
by Edgar Allan Poe. He, was, he wrote these horror stories, which was why I liked to read them. You know, as a young man, you always like to read sort of weird stuff, especially because I wasn't supposed to. And in one of those books was The Mask of the Red Death. And it was based on the, the plagues which ravaged Europe hundreds of years ago. And in this little uh, book, uh, he was envisioning, envisaging these demons, these demons who were the cause, you know, of these, these plagues. And one day these demons, they met together in a forest somewhere in Europe. And the demon from Paris said, yeah, I killed you know, a thousand people. And the one from Berlin said, I killed 1,500. The one from, from London, I killed 2,000. And the one from Brussels said, I killed, 10, well, I killed only 200. And fear killed 2,000. And I remember reading that great insight of this author. The plague kills only a small number. The fear kills more people than that. And even I remember quoting that during the SARS crisis or during the, the bird flu crisis. Because many people sitting amongst you have come from Hong Kong. They're sitting right in here. <laughs> and maybe they have bird flu. <laughs> and they're going to carry it into the Buddhist community and start the epidemic in Perth. Oh my goodness. Do you feel a bit hot this evening? <laughs> you can see fear kills more people than the disease itself. And that's actually very true. If you don't think that fear can kill, and there's a, that story which I think I told a few weeks ago of a guy in jail in England over a hundred years ago. He was about to be executed by hanging. And some psychologists, some scientists had permission to do this really gross experiment on him. They went to his cell the night before his execution and told him the law had been changed he would still have to die tomorrow morning, but this time not by hanging, he would have his throat cut. And they let this poor man think about that all night. In the morning at dawn, as happens with executions, they came for him, tied his hands securely behind his back, put a blindfold over his eyes, led him to the place of execution. A priest you know, just gave him his last rites or whatever they did for him. And then they took a knife and they cut his throat and he fell down and died. That's what he thought. He had his eyes blindfolded. What had really happened, it was just the scientists and the prison um, governor, whoever it was, the superintendent, took him to the washrooms. And one of them pretended to be the, the priest. And then when they finished the, reading out the sentence, they took a knife which was so blunt you couldn't even cut butter with it and they drew it across his throat. He felt the steel on his, uh, on his throat. And at the same time, one of the other scientists just turned on a tap in the washroom and he heard liquid coming out and he felt the steel on his throat and he fell down and died. Not a scratch on him. A very famous psychology experiment. Just how if you believe you're going to die, you do die. That is the power of belief. That is the power of fear. Now Edgar Allan Poe is very, very wise. Fear kills as many people probably more than disease itself. So that is why it's a fear is one of the biggest risks. I don't know that before when I was training to be a school teacher, you know, we were teaching science and it was only a matter of time before some kid playing in the lab would pour concentrated acid over himself or they you know, put in some metal objects into the plugs and electrocute themselves and we never taught first aid so we insisted to get a GP in to teach us first aid and they got this old GP you know, before he's about to retire, a really really wise old man 
who just you know, cut to the chase. And he said, look, if ever you see in any accident, in the school or anyone, some with their leg almost cut off, blood everywhere, lie to them. Say, oh, that's nothing, you'll be okay. Even if, you know, you think they're going to die, lie. He said, because the shock kills more people than the injury itself. And if you tell them, oh, that looks terrible, you could kill them with words like that. I don't know if you know, the GPs or doctors here would agree with that, but I always remember that piece of advice and it always makes a lot of sense to me. It's the fear causes that reaction which can just tip you over the edge into death. It's so always lie to a person to say, that, oh, it's not that bad, you know, you'll be okay, you've got two legs, you can miss one. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go that far, but I think you get the point. So I think there's too much fear around, and so much fear that it kills us. And the fear, what we should really fear, which is only a small amount of stuff, you know, that that's, uh, gets overwhelmed. Anyway, the next question, people who, people who are depressed don't accept it. Also, there's a social stigma attached to it. It gets classified as a mental illness. Depression is something I have struggled with off and on. I started listening to Dharma talks, that's Buddhist talks, to fix my brain, but the first step is to realize and accept that someone is depressed. How can I help someone who I know is depressed? How do I tell her that she is? Now, first of all, it is, they say it gets stigmatized and classified as a mental illness, and people who are mentally ill, they think they are the same as being psychotic. It's just a one, just a, uh, just a one um, size fits all type of designation. And there's no person who is depressed. There is people who suffer bouts of depression, but they're not a depressed person, as I keep on saying. There's no person who is mentally ill. There's people who have episodes of mental illness. In the old story, there's no prisoners, there's no, sorry, there's no criminals. There are people who do crimes. There's no schizophrenics. It's a person who suffers episodes of schizophrenia. Straight away, when you change the language, you avoid the stigmatization. If you say that someone is psychotic, it means that's all they are, all the time. If you say someone is a criminal, you think that that's all they are, there's nothing to them except the crime which defines their life as far as you're concerned. So there's no such thing as a person who's mentally ill, it's a person who suffers bouts of mental illness. And so as soon as you say, you're a person, you're much bigger than that depression, you're not a depressed person, you're a person who happens to right at the moment be experiencing depression. So that's where you can take away a lot of the social stigma, it's a temporary thing, it's impermanent. You know, always like that. And as I uh, mentioned that great story, that great anecdote with a professor of schizophrenia in Singapore some years ago who I met and I asked him how does he treat schizophrenia. He said, just as you've been teaching me, I do not treat schizophrenia in a mental health institute in Singapore. He said, I treat the other part of the patient, which is not schizophrenic. And I really, really admired that guy. He said, you, you really understood, you've got it. You don't just treat depression. You treat the other part of the person, which is not depressed. There's more to them than the depression. Now you do get your bad days, your good days. What about treating the other good days? When you encourage that, it grows and grows. It squashes out the depression. So, <laughs> Uh, realize and accept someone is depressed, yeah, you go through bouts of depression, but never think you are a depressed person. And always remember the other times when you're not depressed. Don't just focus on the two bad bricks in the wall. The other 998 bricks, and that's incredibly important. And the other thing about depression is one of those classic anger-eating monsters I was talking about. Get out of here, you don't belong. And that feeds the depression, makes it worse. You get deeper into that that pit of darkness, which is one of the reasons when you don't feed the monster, you don't say, get out of here, but welcome depression, thank you for visiting me. That actually overcomes it. It stops feeding it, and it just fades away. Don't get depressed about being depressed. It's a hard thing to do, but you can change attitudes. It's not that hard to do. So, it's, as I said, it's hard to do, and I said not hard to do. It can be done. And you see people who do it. 
So that's one of the great antidotes to depression. Welcome depression. Enjoy your depression. Because once you start enjoying it, it vanishes. You're actually using a very, very smart, sneaky technique to get around the back of depression and overcome it. So that's one way you can actually do that. But it is also important to accept that these are, you know, that the you are feeling bad, you are feeling depressed. Truth is important, but more than even truth is actually seeing the bigger picture. It's only your bouts of depression. You're not a depressed person. You're a person who has moments of depression. That is more accurate to the truth. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience here? Yes. Over there. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, like some people, when when they are depressed, uh, uh, yeah, usually they feel lethargic and they don't do things and things like that. But um, how um, sometimes um, people could be like just lazy uh, and not do things. So how a depressed person? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, people who frequently get depressed, how that person can identify that if he or she is just depressed or just lazy? Is there a <laughs> <laughs> What's the difference between being depressed and being lazy? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the good ways of overcoming depression is that thing which I was mentioning earlier <coughs> on to the people at the retreat, seasonal affective disorder, SAD, sad. And coming into Nolamara this afternoon, it was raining, it was dark, it just reminded me so much of London in December, January, February, which is when you get seasonal affective disorder, sad. People get depressed in London at that time of the year, and no wonder why, because there's no life there. Everything is grey and dull. And then the old joke, people in London, they wear grey clothes, grey suits, grey hats, all the walls are grey, there's no colour in the sky, it's all grey. The rain is grey, drizzle. And everything is so grey, even the tea the English drink. Earl Grey tea. <laughs> no wonder they get depressed. <laughs> and at that time of the year, you know, the light is so dull as well because it's a northern hemisphere, the days are so short. And the simple way of overcoming that type of depression called SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder, is to take those people into a brightly lit room. They just turn the lights up and you make them wear Hawaiian um, dresses, just really bright, over the top, and you play them very loud, bright music. And it's just so stimulating that the seasonal affective disorder disappears. Everyone is happy. Simple, stimulating the senses when you're depressed. So if someone's in bed and they're depressed, play them some Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> play them something which is very, uh, very loud and very bright. Turn up the lights in the room. Go in there, into their room, with this brightly coloured skirt or something. And just that amount, of <laughs> that amount of encouragement, that amount of stimulation actually overcomes a lot of depression. That is actually one of the reasons why on a retreat, people come on these retreats, they have to get up really early in the morning. And it's very depressing when they first get up in the morning, which is why that I have to entertain them and I keep on doing these three great sadhus. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu! Which means no one gets depressed in the morning. You can see just how you can actually liven people up. And when you are depressed, that's probably what you need to do. If you've got a friend who's depressed, who can't get up in the morning, just you know, hire a band, get a few clowns from the circus to come in and do their juggling acts by their bedside. Just make them laugh, stimulate them, and soon they wake up. <laughs> Sometimes we can be so dull and we just allow that dullness, you know, to actually to get into our heads 
rather than putting energy and fun into your life. Like I try and do in these Friday night talks. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't. But you know that I do try. So there we go. That's why you can come to these talks and you never get depressed. Except for today. Because today you get depressed. This is the last talk for another three months. <laughs> okay, so thank you all and thank you for those questions. Now, another question. Okay, go on. Um, it's actually about euthanasia. Euthanasia is not the problem, it's youth all over the world. It's, yeah, I understand that. It's, 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 it's people That's an actually old joke. embracing and welcoming death. Yeah. What? It's like uh, this, this morning on the radio, yeah. someone who's about 40 something years old imported the drugs, named himself. Oh, yeah. Kill himself. Yeah, okay, yeah. Euthanasia. Now, as, as Buddhism is concerned, that is your choice. It's your personal, you're an owner of your karma. So that no, no one should actually make that choice for you. So I make a big distinction between euthanasia, where someone else administers that drug, or no, injects you, which happens a lot in hospitals, or voluntary euthanasia. And voluntary euthanasia, what is your clear choice? But to be a clear choice, it has to be made sure that that choice has no coercion at all. You're not doing it because you're crazy, you're depressed, you're in a bad mood. No, no coercion from family and friends. It has to be really a free choice. And there's something in Buddhism that you are in control of you know, your life and, other, and uh, your destiny. It is your karma. You may not, I may not agree with that's a wise thing to do, but it has to be your choice not other people's choice. And of course, there's many, many times when you look at people, the time when I was really convinced that voluntary euthanasia would be a moral thing to do in some cases, was when I went to the Dementia Ward to see my mother. My mother was fine, but I met a couple of people in Dementia Ward, which were, they were literally waking up every second. And they were in a place they could not recognize with people they didn't know every second of their life, because they couldn't remember. And they were terrified. And I've done this sometimes, I've woken up because I go traveling around overseas, wake up in a hotel in somebody's house or in a temple somewhere, and I first wake up, where the hell am I? And, uh, you know, because I travel a lot. And that is quite scary. And of course, you know, and I've got my memory, oh yes, I'm in Frankfurt today. You remember pretty quickly, so you're fine. But I know what that must be like. Every moment of your life, you're waking up, you don't know where you are, who you're with. No sense of safety at all. Total terror. Continuously. And when I saw two people having that symptom of total terror, you would not allow that even in, even in Guantanamo Bay. You know, they let you go and just to rest for a while between being tortured or whatever. But here was constant. I said, that type of pain I wouldn't wish on anybody. That is really immoral. So sometimes some of those experiences think that if a person, they know that's where they're going to end up, decides voluntary euthanasia, and you cannot fault them at all. So I'm a supporter of that bill. You know, obviously with the safeguards, so it has to be voluntary, with no coercion at all. But I'm a supporter of that. I've, people have argued with me, but say, you know, it has to be a personal choice. Obviously, if you're depressed, you, know, you are not making a, a good choice. You're not really uh, making a, a clear, reasonable choice. But you know, if there's no depression there, then you know, you're very clear about what you want to do and why you want to do it. I'd support that. Ajahn Bam, can I please ask another question? Yeah, go on. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Sri Lankan parents, uh, Buddhist parents, often um, scare the, their kids uh, when they don't um, observe five precepts. They scare them, saying, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you tell a lie, you'll go to hell. <laughs> and, um, things like that. So, uh, did Buddha actually um, uh, spoke about uh, hell and heaven? 
Yes, the Buddha did talk about hell or heaven, but it's just telling one lie is not enough to, you know, to have great consequences, especially if you're a young kid. You know, this you've got to measure a whole life. As I keep on saying, to go to university, you have to ask, answer many, many questions in many exams. If you get one question wrong, you know, when you do your university entrance examination, that does not mean you don't go to university. You know, there may be a hundred questions, you do one wrong, you know, 99 out of a hundred, you'll probably go to Harvard or somewhere. So one question wrong is not the problem. It's when a kid continually lies or when they continually sort of take drugs. That's the problem. So just you know, one or two mistakes when you put it in the context of their whole life is not sort of that bad. And so your kids, they will experiment, they will make mistakes, they will do wrong things as their parents do. So please don't just scare the hell out of them by saying you're going to go to hell for that. And, that. and that's just totally wrong. And also, please don't rule your kids through fear. As I mentioned that last week, inspire them, you know, give them some confidence and also to make sure that they are so confident that they can make their own decisions rather than following their peers. That's the problem with many people. I mentioned that last week, I'm reinforcing it this week. Because some families, they make decisions for their children, basically forcing them to what they should do and when they leave their parents, then they follow their peers, the strong people in their, in their peer group. And those strong people in their peer group make them do stupid things. It goes from parental pressure to peer pressure. Rather than getting the kids strong enough to understand what's right and wrong for themselves. And strong enough to resist. You know, the other people in their age group who say, oh no, let's go to the nightclub and get drunk. Let's do binge drinking, let's do some methamphetamines. They're strong enough to say no, because the parents have given them that degree of independence to make choices. And if you don't reinforce that, you find, yeah, you, you tell your children do what you tell them to do when they're at home, and then they, to, they do what their peers tell them to do when they're out on the street. And some of those peers cannot be trusted. Indeed, yeah. So, um, so uh, it is uh, a bit confusing because if you can get punished uh, for your sins, whatever, <laughs> in this real life as well, then why do you need another hell? Yeah. Well, first of all, you don't get punished for your sins. They say you get punished by your sins. You know, just doing a bad thing just you know, it really hurts you. So it's not the sort of that type of idea of you know, punishment, it's just doing stuff, it just really hurts, you feel very bad about it. But this is a hell and heaven in this life, yeah, you can actually see that. But there's also another question totally about what happens after you die. And that stream of consciousness going on after you die, that has been proven. If anyone is scientific, has got their scientific integrity, and actually bothers to look at the evidence and bothers to consider it with a rational mind. Reincarnation or rebirth is actually a fact. The evidence is compelling. There's too much evidence out there to, to not really consider it and not come to the obvious conclusion, whether you're a Buddhist or not, that when you die, you continue on. And then afterwards, once we establish reincarnation or rebirth, then where you get reborn, and of course, yeah, there will be lower realms, higher realms, and there's evidence for that too. I've been around a long time, I don't uh, believe in these things easily, only when there's really strong evidence, things you see, things you, uh, you know happen. Yeah, there are things like heavens and hells after you die. And if you don't believe me, when you die, you can come back and tell me off. <laughs> I better stop now because <laughs> if you want to come up, please come up afterwards and we can chat because we're already quite late. And I know we've got people from Hong Kong and Singapore, they've got to go back to Jana Grove. It's a long journey. So please, if you want to come up and uh, take the question further, please, you're most welcome. 
But now we're just going to pay respects to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, and then we can finish off the formal part of this evening. Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangha 